Hello everyone, my name is Bhargav Shah. I'm a developer here at Orchid.ai. So, today in our discussion we'll be talking about OpenAI. Uh, before we jump into the details, uh, in our last workshop we talked about Generative Models 101. Uh, the structure about Generative Models, uh, how you can generate, you generate images using uh, outline and text. So, today's topic is on OpenAI and how uh, that was a research paper launched in 2016. Here we are with us, Kumara Nakhilan, Hello, everyone. software engineer at Archie.ai, and uh, we, uh, I would like to, like you to explain us what is OpenAI and what is our mission. So OpenAI is a non-profit research initiative created by Sam Altman, Elon Musk, and a bunch of others. And their primary goal is to create friendly artificial intelligence to benefit humanity. That is their mission statement that they have on their website. Great. So what is so special about this uh, paper? Uh, I know there are five different uh, generative, uh, generative model approaches. Um, if you can list down all the five approaches for us. So two main factors. Really. So one, it's opening. Opening eye is huge. I mean, the fact that it's Elon Musk is <laughs> already makes it a big deal. Right. But um, opening eye is nonprofit. People love it. It provides a lot of tools and resources that people can use. And uh, they do a lot of research. That right. is their purpose. That is their goal, right? And the another factor that makes this article so popular and uh, gave it such a great response in the AI community is the fact that it's about generative models. Generative models is such a new concept. It doesn't really exist because it allows artificial intelligence to actually be creative. It's, it's not a classifier. It's not a regressor. It's something unique, something new. And this really got people interested. And yeah, the combination right. of these two factors made it such a big deal. Right. So, so the approaches. Uh, we'll be talking about five uh, generative model approaches, right? Uh, could you please list down all the five approaches we'll be talking about today? Yeah, sure. So the first approach is GAN, Generative Adversarial Neural Network. Right. The second approach is uh, Variation Auto Encoders. The third approach is um, Auto Regressive Models. The fourth approach is curiosity-driven, um, curiosity-driven exploration in deep re uh, in high-dimensional space via the use of Bayesian neural networks. Right. That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> and, uh, the uh, the final approach is generative adversarial imitation learning. Great. So uh, that's great. So how, uh, let's jump into the first approach, which was uh, generative adversarial new neural network, right? Uh, if you can explain in detail what exactly that approach tells us about. Yeah, of course. Um, so a generative adversarial neural uh, network is actually, it's not one neural network. It's right. set up as a game between two neural networks. Right. So uh, there's a discriminator network and there's a untrained generative network. So uh, the generative network generates outputs, mm -hmm. right? And the discriminator network tells the generative network whether those outputs are... Um, where whether those outputs are accurate or inaccurate. So say I'm passing the word cat into the generative network. And when the generative network is initially untrained, uh, untrained and its weights are uncalibrated, it produces a random output. But then as the, um, as the discriminator network uh, tells the generative network over time whether it's gotten the cat right or wrong, it's able to build an average model of the cat by running back propagation. It's a great way to sense. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned discriminator neural network, right? Uh, I need a little more explanation on what discriminator neural network is. Sure, sure. Is, yeah. So, uh, like I said before, discriminator uh, neural network is a pre-trained classifier. So let's take a specific use case, but before we even go into the use case, right. let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at the word um, adversarial. Right. Because sometimes people get confused by the uh, word adversarial. It's not just uh, a competition between the two bots. Think of it as a student-teacher model. Right. The discriminator is the teacher telling the student whether the student has gotten the answer right or wrong. And it's the student's job to explore how to get the answer, the right answer in the most optimal manner. Right. Yes. So okay. So it basically classifies. Oh, yes. Uh, and let's talk about a use case. <laughs> yeah. So um, say we have a, an image classifier right. Right, that's able to classify the images and it's very, very accurate. Mm -hmm. So we have an untrained generative network and we pass in the word cat. Right? right. So initially it's not gonna get the word cat correct, but uh, it's not gonna generate an actual cat. But over time, as it sends the image to the discriminator network and the discriminator network tells the 
generative network, whether it's created a cat or not, right. slowly its weights start to model a cat towards uh, the overall data distribution of, of a cat. It fits within the data distribution of a cat. And the generative network gets better and better. Right, that was uh, a good detail, thank you. So, uh, talking about the second approach, yeah. which is uh, variational autoencoders, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that, uh, a detailed explanation of the second approach and how uh, that is coming to the five approach model. Okay. Yeah. So, variational autoencoders, right. what they essentially do is, they have a large number of output nodes and uh, the, the number of out, uh, input perceptrons is less than the number of output perceptrons, hmm. right? And what you do is you, you have a pre-trained set of data uh, with, where the input is just the name of the, uh, the image or whatever it is you're trying to produce. Right. And the output is several samples of the image. So since there, there are less input perceptrons and output perceptrons, naturally the, the data has to follow such that there, there are less input samples for a given set of output samples. Right. But what makes variational autoencoders um, unique is the fact that the, the actual, the word cat, is, its binary form is not directly used to represent the input. Instead, the variational autoencoder uses uh, all, the, all the examples of the cat and then uses the actual uh, weights that it calculates while backpropagating to generate its own unique, um, uh, un own unique code. And then this code is matched through a traditional algorithm to the word cat. So right. this allows uh, the variational autoencoder to, to learn how to generate images much faster because the backpropagation required to actually end up at this, this unique code that the autoencoder produces is, is much less than other forms of generative uh, networks. Right. So. Um I think, uh, from my understanding, I feel that, let's say if I write cat or a specific code, will I be getting a cat image generated uh, out of this model, or how does it exactly work when it comes to a use case of that? Okay, so you input the word cat, right, um, and you have a bunch of images. So right. when it trains, when it lear learns that all of these are of the same image, so of the same uh, object, sorry, in this case it happens mm -hmm. to be a cat, right? It uses all of the, uh, it, it, when it back propagates, it generates a unique code and matches that unique code to a cat instead of actually using the word cat mm -hmm. and matching that with the images. So that, uh, I hope that answers your question. Right, yeah, it, yeah, it does. I mean, I understand. Uh, from the way you explain, I think I kind of get my answer. So, uh, talking about the third approach, uh, which is auto regressive models, okay. uh, let's get an explanation on that. So, auto regressive models uses two recur, uh, recurrent neural networks. So let's take images as a, as a specific use case. So right. it has two recurrent neural networks that run horizontally and vertically to produce the image. Hmm. So, uh, so if, like I said, we're taking images specifically as a, as a use case, right? So the first layer of the recurrent neural net produces a slightly blurred image. So let's take the word cat in. <laughs> right. Again, right? Okay. So we pass cat in, it produces a slightly br blurred image. Right. And you can't tell that that's a cat. But then it feeds that input back into the uh, uh, recurrent neural net and produces something that looks more like a cat. You may still not be able to uh, tell that that's a cat, but it produces that. It does that enough times, right. and eventually it creates a very crisp and sharp image. Uh, but the advantage of this generative neural network is that it has variation, so it doesn't look like a specific training sample hmm. that allows it to appear more natural. Okay. So horizontally and vertically, I think I will stick to that two, uh, that two words, right? How does that uh, work in theory? Like two one-dimensional recurring neural network. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so how does that work? Uh, would you like me to draw your diagram? Oh, that would be great. Okay, so um, oh, let's bring it here and try. Okay, uh, excuse my drawing. <laughs> Um, let me straighten that line out a bit. So, give me one moment to finish drawing the grid. So, uh, when you're drawing this, what exactly is that? Uh, this, this is a blank slate, so it's okay. just a blank array. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, eventually becomes an actual if. So, right. So, initially the recurrent neural net produces a bunch of outputs, right? It's, um, it, it uses the, al the algorithm produces a bunch of outputs given the input string cat. Right, so okay. that's, I'm just putting in random values here because I'm not a neural network. But. Okay. 
whatever. So right. you get a bunch of values here. Um, okay, right? So what the recurrent neural net does is, uh, what, what I hear? so what the recurrent neural net does is, mm -hmm. um, it runs this way and this way. Right. So like you said, two one-dimensional one dimensional recurring, recurrent neural, neural right. nets. So in the first run, it produces, um, it pr uses this, it uses the, the left pixel and okay. the top pixel, each okay. recurrent neural net, it uses that to predict the value of this, right? Right. And then it does that for every um, every grid over here. And eventually, it, it starts over here, and right. it does that for every grid all the way to the So sort of iterates over to every, every single pixel. Right. And yeah. Okay. But again, it comes back right. and does that again. Hmm. Now, depending depending on how many times you want the recurrent neural net to run, it'll it'll run that many times. Right. And eventually, it'll produce your uh, your cap. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I think actually we have completed the third uh, third approach. Uh, before we jump into the fourth one, uh, to our live viewers who have missed out or maybe joined later, I would like to give you a brief recap of what has happened so far. We talked about five different approaches uh, when it comes to generative models. The first one was generative adversarial neural network. Uh, the second one was variational autoencoders, and the third one autoregressive models. Uh, now we're talking about the fourth and the fifth. Uh, the fourth is curiosity-driven deep reinforcement learning uh, via Bayesian neural network, right? That so, is, yeah, yes. that's kind that's of awesome. Awesome. That's <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, uh, let's so talk about it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Let me break it down. Yeah. Okay, so first, what are high-dimensional spaces? Right. Now, uh, any every machine learning algorithm has inputs and outputs. Hmm. Now, given the fact that, uh, as far as the algorithm is concerned, and every input variable is independent of other input variables. Therefore, each input corresponds to a dimension. So the more input variables, the more <laughs> dimensions. Therefore, if there's a large number of uh, input variables, it's a high dimensional space. Right. Now, what's a Bayesian neural network? As far as runtime is concerned, a Bayesian neural network is a regular neural network. However, it's different from a regular neural network during training time. It uses Bayes' theorem to augment the traditional um, stochastic gradient descent algorithm, mm -hmm. and it accounts for uncertainty within the training data itself. So you can have a couple of false positives and not uh, destroy the entire neural net's uh, uh, accuracy. That's right. similar to how humans think, right? We can encounter a couple false positives. And it uses this Bayesian neural network to explore high dimensional space. Okay. So, uh I understand that it, uh, it uses uh, Bayesian neural network to explore high dimensional space, right? Um, how does that come uh, come into picture when it comes to a use case? Like, oh, how yeah. does that, yeah. okay. how does that case, yeah. create yeah. generative models? Of course. So um, whenever you're trying to generate, let's take a cat again, okay. right? Um, <laughs> you like cat. <laughs> okay. So there's a specific data distribution for right. a cat, right? Okay. Um, and when, you, when you're trying to get the optimal value within that data distribution, which would be a point or a group of points, right. what you do is you have to explore a high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. a, a certain dimension could correspond to the number of legs or to the number of eyes or whatever. Right? And you explore this data distribution. Now, this is just a simple example. There's so many variables. Right. An invasion neural network May, like if it, if it were an evasion neural network, it might end up at a local maximum. It might not come to the optimal value for a cat. Now, mm -hmm. what evasion neural networks can do is they can, to a certain degree, they can estimate whether they're in a local or global maximum. Now, there's no such, uh, no algorithm guarantees a global maximum, right. except for a quantum computer. And we don't have access to those systems. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know Google does with their quantum AI, right. but we don't have Not access to those. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, thank you for explaining the fourth approach. And I think that answers my question. Um, okay. Talking about the fifth approach, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, that was imitation learning, right? Yes. Right. So, yeah, let's talk about it. So, in the previous generative imitation learning. Yes. Yeah. In, the, in the previous um, in the previous example, we had an agent exploring a high dimensional space, right. and there was a reward function, which is how high the uh, 
the, how close it is to the to the center of the data distribution of a cap, mm -hmm. right? The closer you get, the high, uh, the better. Uh, the closer you get, the higher the, the reward value. Right. However, there may not always be a reward value, or sometimes it may be incredibly difficult that even the best uh, uh, algorithms that um, that are purposed to traverse a high dimensional space mm -hmm. may never reach a, a, a global maximum. Because in the previous example, I explained that it's no global maximum is uh, guaranteed unless you use a quantum computer. Right. right. Yeah. So what imitation learning does is it takes it takes the uh, takes a bunch of examples mm -hmm. from a system that already possesses those skills, and then adjusts the the weights in a in a minor way so as to actually achieve a global maximum. Right. Okay. Um, so imitation. Uh, from that, what I think I uh, read about it somewhere, imitation learning. So is it something that a human human imitates something and you let the machine do the same thing? Uh, you basically make a model which imitates whatever a human does. Is that something like that or is it uh, a totally different thing? When it comes to use cases. Are you, uh, you're asking for specific examples? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so for the most part, if we had a machine learning algorithm, right, uh, they could already perform the task, we wouldn't need uh, imitation learning. Right. This works when you have some non-computer system that can hmm. already perform this task, right? So say you have a person that is that has that's walking with a bunch of flex sensors attached to their legs, right? Okay. And say you have a robot. So you uh, you walk, mm -hmm. and you, at the same time you you have a gyroscope on your body, right? And all that data gets fed to a machine, right? right. So your input is your gyroscopic value, your output is the uh, actuation. Now, like I said, all generative models have more outputs than they do inputs, right? So this, this, uh, this data of the person walking is stored in the, is stored in, it, in the machine learning, and this machine learning algorithm is trained on it. Okay. And since, since, it's, uh, since a person is already walking, right, and we already have a certain idea of the data distribution. So this allows the algorithm to better find the global maximum, the optimal value for walking. However, it has to adjust for the weights because a person may have, their legs might weigh a little different from a robot's <laughs> legs. Well, obviously, right. right? And it would have to account for that. But okay. since it has um, predefined data, it can navigate the data distribution much better than any other algorithm. Awesome, okay. Thank you for uh, giving detailed explanation on all, all five approaches. I think uh, we all got key insights uh, after learning about OpenAI. Uh, why is it so um, driven these days? I think it was one of the best articles in the last couple of months. And uh, um, after all this, if I ask you a question, which model would be the best?